Hello, and welcome to the Urban Classroom. Hi, my name is Mrs. Briggs, and I want to thank you for joining me today in the Urban Classroom. We are now on Unit 10. This is the last video lesson for our series. Today, we're going to learn about settling the Western frontier. It is a lot of information, so let's just go ahead and get started. The Great Plains. This area was home to hundreds of different tribes of Native American people indigenous people and they spoke many different languages um, native american groups were not all the same they have different beliefs different traditions different customs and so it would not be fair to say that all native americans were the same they weren't um, native american they were able to survive in this area called the great plains because of the buffalo millions of buffaloes roam this flat area that you can see on the map referred to as the new bread basket so you have uh, indigenous people in this area you have buffaloes in this area but white settlers are moving into this area because they want to be able to create and build homes and start farms and also have the railroad come through because you're trying to connect the east to the west you have businesses that want to get started in this area unfortunately this is causing some conflict between the indigenous people that already live there and then the american settlers who are moving west into this area called the great plains Traveling west past the mountains. In time past, it was very difficult for colonists and settlers to move past the Appalachian Mountains. Mountains are dangerous. It's hard to get over them. The terrain is very rough. And that created a problem. But as time passed and people developed better technology, different transportation systems, then it becomes a little bit easier to travel now they're moving over to the west past the rocky mountains in the area where you'll see um going towards nevada going towards california you got to get over those rocky mountains first and that's a dangerous area people lose their lives but there's something about the pioneer spirit of americans that will make them face dangerous situations and hope for a better life so families they gathered together and bought wagons that were covered wagons and just put everything that you own that you could carry inside that wagon and you are heading west trying to settle that area but it was very dangerous but people took the chance and they wanted just to have a better life In addition to wanting a better life, there were other reasons why people wanted to go west. Some of those reasons included cheap farmland, an opportunity to look for gold and silver and strike it rich. It was more grazing land for animals if you wanted to have a farm or a ranch. So people decided that they wanted to move west. Some of those people included settlers, and some of those people were freedmen, black people who wanted a better life and wanted to work on ranches and also look for gold. A lot of black people moved over to the West. So these are some of the reasons why people decided they would take the chance and even risk their lives moving West past the Rocky Mountain, past the Appalachian Mountain to settle the West. life in the west life in the west was hard because you're going into an area where there aren't houses available that you could just go rent 
There aren't any stores in the area where you can just go buy groceries. No, you're going to have to do a lot of hard work if you plan on surviving in the West. The land is flat. It's wide. And it's not easy to live there. There aren't any trees enough where you could cut down to get the lumber and build a house. No, it's challenging. So you have to look around at their your natural environment and see how you're going to build a house. What can you use? Well, people use sod, like patches of grass. You know, you cut them out into squares, patches of grass, and you build your house using mud, dirt, dry grass, mixing it together and trying to build your house. Now you can imagine if you have a house that's made out of dirt and patches of grass, well, you gonna have a lot of bugs, a lot of insects, even snakes can come into that area. That's challenging. Also, you gotta think about how am I gonna heat my house? Well, you better go look for some buffalo chips. Now, I'm not talking about the buffalo chips that you can eat at the store. No, you don't want to eat these. Buffalo chips, they also are called cow patties. They call them uh, cattle chips. It's just a fancy word for the poop, the poop of the animal, of the cows, of the buffaloes. They are, um, you can get them and you put them out in the sun, they get dried and you're able to light them on fire and that creates heat. That is what people used in the early West to, to heat their, um, to be able to cook, to be able to stay warm. Also, another problem is there's not a lot of rain in this area. So it's challenging to get your crop to grow and to water your crops. You also have to deal with the winter. The winter time is bitterly cold. So you take the chance you move to the west but just know that life was going to be very hard it was going to be very challenging but if you stay there long enough and you worked hard then there was a good probability that you could survive the homestead act of 1862 the government wants people to move west. So we kind of go back a little bit in time when Abraham Lincoln was still alive and he was president. Well, he worked with Congress and they came up with this program called the Homestead Act. The Homestead Act, if you look at the word homestead, you kind of get an idea of what it's all about. It's about getting a home. Well, the citizens could buy government land for a really cheap price. And if you're the buyer, you'd have to meet some requirements and pay a small fee, but you could get enough land where you can build your house. And then you're going to need to start a farm. Those were two requirements that you had to accomplish if you're going to be a part of this program. Now, if you can take care of the land for five years, and you got your house, you got your farm, you do that for five years, then that property could become yours. Now, this opportunity was available to European immigrants for single women and also freedmen. Freedmen were the, the, the black people who got their freedom papers. Okay, so if you were free, then you can go into this area and you could apply for this program and be able to um, get land at a really cheap price. Now, unfortunately, if you um, did not keep your farm up and you didn't build your house after five years, then you wouldn't be able to get the land. You didn't meet the requirements. Also, any person who fought in the Civil War, then they were not eligible for this program as well. The land was available. A lot of people would benefit from it, but in the end, there were some problems with corruption where um, a lot of businesses and organizations, large organizations were able to get a lot of that land that was meant to just help the, the everyday common person get a leg up in life. The Murrell Act of 1862. 
Again, we're going back in history when Abraham Lincoln was still president, he was still alive. He worked with Congress and they created this program called the Morrill Act of 1862. Well, it's all about education. The federal government gave federal land to different states and the states could use the land to start public colleges and universities. The first kind of uh, institutions that were built were for agriculture and mechanical arts, such as Texas A&M. Well, these schools also offered um, an opportunity for African Americans to get educated as well through historical black colleges in different universities. The Bessemer Steel Process. During the 1850s, many factories started using a process called the Bessemer Process, and it was a way to make steel. See, steel comes from a different metal, it comes from iron. That iron is melted at a very high temperature degree and it transformed into steel. Now, if you want to know specifics, you're going to have to go talk to a science teacher for that. All I know is that iron is melted at a certain temperature and then it changes into steel. Well, that steel is going to be very important because America is trying to uh, connect the east to the west with these railroads and so you are able to use that steel to make the railroad tracks. So the railroads are being built and they're going to be able to connect cities to resources and to factories all across America thanks to this process called the Bessemer process. The Transcontinental Railroad. When you listen to the word transcontinental, you got to break it down and really understand what it means. Trans means across. Continental, you're talking about the continent. So it is the railroad going across the continent. It will be able to connect the east to the west coast. By connecting the east to the west, the government is creating an opportunity for more people to move west easily. But the area has to be cleared. There are buffaloes in this area and the government said that the buffaloes were in the way. And so they hired people to kill the buffalo for fun and for sport. The main reason why the area was cleared is because the railroad is coming through. And that was government plan to have this trans Continental Railroad. Chinese laborers. To build that transcontinental railroad, America needed a lot of workers. There were people in China who um, were leaving their country because of problems with poverty and just disorder in China. So a lot of people left China and came to the United States. Uh, in the area where California is because they were looking for gold. They wanted to strike it rich during the gold rush and have a better life for their family. Unfortunately, a lot of Chinese immigrants did not find gold and they had to figure out, well, how are we going to survive? How are we going to live here? It just so happened that the Transcontinental Railroad was being built and many laborers were needed. So a lot of Chinese men will be able to get a job working for the Transcontinental Railroad. Unfortunately, Chinese people experienced discrimination and racism in America when they came to um, build a better life. They were not paid the same rate as other men. They were not given the same housing that other men were given, but still Chinese people, they continue to do their job and help build America and help successfully uh, build that transcontinental railroad.
When a transcontinental railroad was being built, you had two different teams working towards a center point. The center point is Promontory Point, Utah. So on the West Coast, you had the Central Pacific Railroad, and most of the, their workers were Chinese. But you also had freedmen that worked on the Central Pacific Railroad, as well as Mormons. Then you have Irish. Irish men worked with the Union Pacific Railroad. There are other groups that work with them, but predominantly it was Irish men who work with the Union Pacific Railroad. And they're starting from Omaha, Nebraska. Now, each railroad company have men working and laying down track and they have to make the two railroads connect. The area, the point where they connect is called Promontory Point and it's in the state of Utah. Now, now that America was connected, you have the East and the West connected, you can have passenger and freight, supplies, provisions, they can be transported East to West in a matter of days as opposed to a matter of months because before this transcontinental railroad, it would take months to travel from coast to coast. But settlers are now rushing into the area to live that was once considered to be wasteland, a desert area, but now it is connected thanks to the help of the Chinese workers, the Irish workers, freedmen, Mormons, um, all working together to help build this transcontinental railroad. This is a famous portrait showing Promontory Point, Utah, where the two railroads connected and the golden spike was driven into the uh, ground to connect the two. Now that golden spike, they didn't leave it there. It's actually in a museum today, but people want to take pictures and show the success of the railroads being connected. The Indian Wars. There was a lot of conflict between white settlers and indigenous people, and it's mostly over the land. Now, some people say that these Indian Wars last from 1840s to the 1880s. However, some people say that the Indian Wars happened back in 1492, when Christopher Columbus came over and had a lot of problems and conflict with indigenous people and brought sicknesses and brought diseases and even killed uh, many Native Americans. But the Indian Wars that I'm referring to is during this time period of 1840s to 1880s. Native Americans were upset about losing so much of their land to these settlers who kept taking more and more and forcing them off of their land. So when Native Americans fought back, then uh, the federal government of the United States also fought back, you're going to have thousands of people killed. It is reported that nearly 45,000 indigenous people were killed during the Indian Wars, and as much as 19,000 um, white settlers were killed during the Indian Wars, during this time period. Now, the Americans had more technology, better developed technology, more weaponry that made it almost impossible for Native Americans to successfully resist uh, their encroachment on their land. You also have black men who fought, the Buffalo Soldiers. The Buffalo Soldiers were African American soldiers who had served in the Civil War and they stayed in the military. They didn't get out. And so now they work for the United States government. And part of their job was to clear routes so that more settlers could travel west. And they also helped uh, hang up the telegraph lines as uh, communication began to expand from east to west. Now, the name of the Buffalo Soldier, well, people are not quite sure how um, African-Americans got this name, Buffalo Soldier. Some people say that the Native Americans saw the hair 
of the African American soldiers, and it reminded them of the way the buffalo looked. And so some people say that's how the name Buffalo Soldier was given to African Americans. But other people believe that Native Americans, they really value the buffalo, the strength and the power of the buffalo, and the way that African American men fought reminded uh, Native Americans of the buffalo. And so it was out of respect that the name Buffalo Soldiers was given to African American men who fought for the government. The Dawes Act destroys Native American culture. Throughout history, whenever there has been a land dispute between indigenous people and the United States government, the policy had been to remove Native Americans from the desired area and to place them in an area that was less desirable. When we look at the Dawes Act, this was a a law, some legislature that was created by the United States, and it encouraged Native American people to divide their land into smaller parts so that they could have private ownership. One of the major goals of the Dawes Act was to help Native American people assimilate into American culture, American society. And that word assimilate means like to, to blend in, to fit in. Well, Native American people, they already had their own culture. They already had their own traditions. And many of them did not want to assimilate into American society. But when you did not assimilate, then there was problems that could lead to war. So it was just a lot of conflict. And there's always been that tension between indigenous people and the United States government. Well, this Dawes Act Again, it encourages Native Americans to assimilate and to own private property. So each family, each indigenous family would be able to get an amount of land so that they can use to raise their family, take care of themselves and, and have a house, maybe a small farm. The remaining part of that land though is given back to the United States government. Because of this Dawes Act, it nearly destroyed American, Native American culture. Because first of all, a lot of Native American tribes were not farmers. Some tribes were hunters. They were warriors. And so their life did not circle around farming, but yet they're being forced to be farmers. Then you have almost 100 million acres of land that is going to be returned back to the United States. So land that once belonged to Native Americans, they get their individual personal property and then all the rest goes back to the United States government. They will lose so much land. I mean, think about 100 million acres one acre is the size of a football field. So they're going to lose the amount of land that is equivalent to 100 million football fields. A lot of people thought that this Dawes Act was unfair and cheated Native Americans out of their land. It caused a lot of conflict. It caused a lot of problems. And even today, indigenous people still continue to have problems with the United States over land and land rights. To continue our lesson, we need to understand this uh, vocabulary word, reservation, specifically Indian reservation. A reservation is a designated area of land and it's managed by uh, indigenous people and in Indian tribes, but it's also supervised by a government agency, United States government agency called the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Okay. In the reservations, this is where a lot of Native Americans live, 
by choice to help keep their culture, to help keep their tradition. And it's separated from blending in or assimilating into American culture. So an Indian reservation, that's an area of land where you have Native Americans live and they live with other people from their tribe. Problems on the reservations. Part of the United States policy was to remove indigenous people from their land and place them on reservations whenever there was a land dispute. Now on the reservation, life was very challenging. It was difficult. The American government had promised to provide food, blankets, farm equipment, seeds, even training to indigenous people that moved to the reservations. But unfortunately, many of those Native American tribes, they never received adequate provisions. They never received the training on how to farm successfully or the equipment that was needed to farm successfully. As a result, Native Americans, they suffered in, on those reservations. A lot of them did not have enough healthy food to eat. Um, they had untreated health problems, living in poverty, not having enough money, and then the quality of education was inferior to what um, other Americans were receiving. So there was a lot of problems on reservations and reservations, they still exist today. And many indigenous people um, continue to have a lot of problems on the reservations. But Native American people, they have the right to live where they want to. Some choose to stay on reservations because again, it's about keeping your culture. It's about keeping your uh, way of life. It's about staying together. So Native Americans live on both on the reservation and off the reservation, free to come and go as they please. Now I want to talk to you about the second industrial revolution. The second industrial revolution is also known as the technological revolution. It's going to last between 1870 to 1914. That's up till the point of World War I begins. But during the second industrial revolution, the focus of factories have changed. They no longer are focused on um, helping with the Civil War because Civil War is over. So businesses are now making items that people need in their everyday life. It's items such as uh, baby carriages, rocking chairs, tables, um, sewing machines, clothes, soap, butter, things of that nature. Um, these factories and these machines are a place where a lot of people could come and get a job with more and more people leaving the rural areas, those farm areas, they're now going to those urban areas where the factories are at because it's about getting a, a job. The low cost goods and products are being created in those factories. And now you have items being able to be transported through the transcontinental railroad from the East Coast to the West Coast. Also cattle being able to be transferred. Uh, livestock is this second industrial revolution also has a lot of inventions being made as well. So the technology is getting better. Um, more steel is being used. That's one of the reasons why the transcontinental railroad was able to be built because during the second industrial revolution, you're having more and more steel uh, being produced because of that Bessemer process. So the second industrial revolution, we know about the first one that happened, but there was a second one and you're talking about mass production, factories, machines, building things that people need. European immigrants come to America. 
The United States has been known for being the land of opportunities. It is a place where immigrants come for a better life. Well, these large ocean going passenger ships are being built and they can carry hundreds of people at a time. And it is making the journey from Europe to America faster, cheaper, and easier. Now, when immigrants loaded those passenger ships and came to America, a lot of them were looking for that better life, more opportunities. They're coming from Germany, Ireland, Italy, Russia, Austria, Hungary, even Poland, looking for the American dream. But unfortunately, a lot of them will not find the American dream. A lot of them will not find better opportunities. A lot will experience overcrowded living areas, racism, discrimination, low paying job and unsafe work conditions. But yet still European immigrants continue even today to come to America. And it's really about looking for a chance to work hard and make a better life. Protection, immigrants not welcomed. When a lot of European immigrants were coming to America, white Americans said that they were at risk of losing their job. Too many immigrants were coming over and taking their jobs away. So white Americans began to join what are called labor unions. Think of a labor union as a group, a representative group. And these groups, they have lawyers. And the lawyers, they talk to the employers, they talk to the bosses, and they try to demand better pay and fair treatment for their American workers. Now, these workers were skilled workers. They had a craft, they had a trait. And they were protected in, these, in the labor union. But if you were an unskilled worker, just had a regular everyday job that didn't require a lot of skill or education, then you weren't protected because the labor union did not work with unskilled workers. Neither did the labor union work with um, blacks or freedmen. Now, initially, the public reaction to the labor union was hostile. A lot of people thought that it wasn't good to give too much power to an organization like a labor union because they might take advantage of the workers. They might influence the uh, employers too much. But labor unions were able to successfully help skilled workers and they began to grow. Today, we still have labor unions, people who are uh, police officers, firemen, medical professions, construction workers, um, a lot of people that have those kind of skilled jobs, they belong to a labor union today. And those labor unions fight for the rights of their workers. But originally, the first labor unions in the United States, um, they did not welcome immigrants because they thought that immigrants were taking American jobs. Knights of Labor, the labor union movement. One of the most successful labor unions was the Knights of Labor. They help their workers get organized. The workers would pay a certain amount of money every month to the labor union, and then the labor union would help them get organized, would speak to employers, would demand uh, better pay and better working conditions because work conditions were very challenging. People could get hurt or people could die because of dangerous work conditions. One of the main issues though was the long hours. And American workers like, we don't wanna work these hours anymore. I don't wanna work 12, 14 hours, 16 hours every day, that's too much. So, the labor unions began to fight for Americans' right to have shorter hours 
of work. What they really wanted were the 888. That's what I like to call them, the 888. The labor unions demanded that the workers get eight hours to work. If I come to work, I only want to work eight hours. That's it. And then they said that workers needed eight hours to rest. You need to be able to sleep for eight hours because you come to work after you've been working 20 hours, 16 hours. It's like you can put your life in danger and have an accident because you didn't get enough rest. So they said American workers, they only need to work eight hours. Then they need to rest eight hours. And then they said that American workers need to have eight hours to do whatever they want to. Uh, if I need time with my family, time with my friends, then I should have eight hours out of the day to do that. So that's the 888 for work, for rest, and to do whatever you want to do. We've been talking about settling the West, and now I want to talk to you about the two main paths to U.S. citizenship because we had a lot of immigrants during the 1800s, as well as the 1700s who came over to uh, the United States and now want citizenship. So let's look at the two paths. One is by birth. Anyone who was born in the United States is an American citizen. That's by birth. Now the other way, and there's many other ways, these are the two that I'm focusing on today, is by birth and the other one is by naturalization. Now, by naturalization, you have to meet certain criteria and you have to do certain things. This is for people who are not born in the United States. So to be naturalized, you have to be at least 18 years old and you have to uh, live in the United States for at least five years. There's a test that you must take to show uh, that you can read, write, and speak uh, basic English. There is a test that has to be taken, and it's about history, and it's about government. So if you know someone who's trying to uh, get their citizenship in the United States, this whole series of video lessons could help them because we have been learning about American history. And that's one of the uh, assessments that a person who's trying to get their citizenship, they need to be able to pass that government test. So the way that it works, you file an application, you get interviewed, you take the language test and the civics test about um, American history. If you pass, you pay also a fee. There's amount of money, a certain amount of money that must be paid. And then you take the oath where you pledge allegiance to the United States. So those are two main pathways to citizenship in the United States. Expectations for citizens. Once a person becomes a citizen of the United States, the government expects certain things from them. The government expects a person to obey the law, to vote, to serve on jury duty, to testify in court if you're summoned, that person is expected to stay informed about public issues. You should know about the news and what's going on in the world, what's going on in the country. A person who is becoming a citizen is also expected to attend school. You've got to go to school and you got to work hard because the government needs your tax money. So everyone who has a job uh, will pay taxes. Well, if you make a certain amount of money, you have to pay taxes. And that tax money is used to help support the government expenses. Uh, the government has to help states. And the government has to run offices and programs. And that all requires money. And that money comes from the taxpayers. Also, the government expects U.S. citizens to be willing to serve in the military if necessary. So there's a lot of expectations for people who are citizens of the United States. We're about to wrap up this unit. And so I want to talk to you about great American literature and authors. 
we have books and books are written for several different reasons they're they're written to inform that means to give you information they're also written to entertain that means to help you pass the time and in with enjoyable um, literature and unfortunately America was dependent for a long time on European writers so the books that Americans were reading were written by people who lived in Europe but there weren't any Americans who were producing great literature but that changes that changes in the 1800 you're gonna have people like Mark Twain he'll write about uh, Huckleberry Finn the adventures of Huckleberry Finn you'll have Herman Melville you'll have Washington Irving Sleepy Hollow you have the time machine by HG Wells well these different books referred to as literature their writings by these authors were considered masterpieces they were considered some of the greatest work ever produced by Americans and there are a lot more other writers who are considered great American authors now it's in in these books you have different themes these are some of the common themes man versus self so in a book it might be about a person who's having a problem with uh, himself or herself or a problem with another person that's man versus self you might have a problem with man versus nature um, that could be a person and there's some kind of natural disaster like an earthquake a hurricane or tornado uh, lost at sea some kind of issue with nature is a popular theme as well think of a theme as a subject and then you have man versus machine that's when um, a person is having an issue or conflict with a machine so these are the popular themes uh, America had developed their own writers and you have some authors who did some really great work that is remembered even hundreds years of later and some of these books I'm sure you're going to be reading them when you get into high school but uh, this is the time period where American authors began to cut the cords with Europe and said we don't need your writings anymore we got our own In addition to great American literature and authors, Americans began to develop different genres of art. They began to practice these different genres. Think of the word genre as a type, different types of art. So romanticism is a type of art. It is about evoking emotions when you look at the painting. It's about celebrating the imagination, escaping reality. And it's about nationalism. Nationalism means a love for your country. In addition to romanticism, you have realism. And this is a type of art, a genre that many Americans were beginning to paint. Now, realism is about capturing what is true in life, what's ugly in life, the challenges in life. It's about focusing on daily problems in life. So if you look at the two paintings, you can see that romanticism is quite different from realism. The last thing I want to talk to you about is transcendentalism. Transcendentalism is about being yourself being at peace with nature being your best person and doing what you're afraid to do these ideas were promoted by a man named ralph waldo emerson he was an essayist i mean he wrote essays a lot and his ideas were captured in a book called the american scholar he's talking about being a friend that if you want to have friends then you have to be a friend he's about being 100 being real he's about enjoying nature and having peace with nature 
His ideas are still reflected in American society and culture even today. So that's Ralph Waldo Emerson. Today we learned about Unit 10. It was settling the Western frontier. There was a lot of information that we covered. If you didn't get all of it, make sure you go back and watch the video again. Well, congratulations. You just finished the last video lesson for the series of 8th grade U.S. History with Mrs. Brooks. I want to thank you for joining me today. It has been a privilege. It has been an honor to help teach you and help share information about U.S. history from the 13 original English colonies to settling the Western frontier after the Civil War and Reconstruction. I wish you well on all of your assessments. And remember, you can always go back from Unit 1 through Unit 10 to learn about U.S. history. I want you to have a great day. And why don't you just make it a great day? Bye.